Welcome back to the Joe Mack podcast. I have a very special guest. He is James Reynolds. <laughs> he is a very successful a Hollywood actor. He's also a United States Marine Corps veteran. James, thank you for being with me. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Joe, for having me here. This is, uh, it's fun. Looking forward to it. Oh, absolutely. Likewise. You and I are crossing paths because we are on the same production. There's a upcoming drama series entitled Promised Land that we are both yes. going to be starring in. Great and title, isn't, it? isn't that a great title? I think it's a wonderful title, Promised Land. I like it. Oh, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Now, I'm really looking forward to working with you in person. Um, we've been on calls together via video chat, and I'm really looking forward to, you know, getting a little snapshot into your backstory and kind of some keys to success, um, you know, fr from your perspective. If we could start, you know, from the beginning, because you've had a very interesting life before your acting career, I think that'd be the best bet. What do you say? Okay. Well, it well, sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been, uh, I mentioned this before, and uh, several different people, it's been a, a very interesting life. I, I'm, uh, you know, even even the, the down parts were uh, things I don't regret, and they, of course the highs are were wonderful. And uh, no, I, uh, I started in a very, very small town, uh, Oskaloosa, Kansas, and uh, only about 800 people when I left town. And uh, I actually left town, as you said, we're both, uh, we're both former jarheads, we're both uh, former Marines. And uh, I left when I was 17, three days out of high school, got on my first flight, first plane flight, and flew to San Diego for boot camp. And, uh, and life kind of spun out. I kind of used that as a, as a second birth in a way, uh, because my first 17 years were spent in that little town. And my experience of the world were, were through television, books. Love to read. I still love to read. I knock out, I knock out at least one, sometimes two books a week. I love, uh, uh, you know, I created this world, this, this wonderful dream world. And um, uh, that was full of books and film and TV and sports. Love, love sports. So I'm trying to get light on myself. Go ahead. There you go. Thank you, James. So just to recap that, you yes. basically started out in a very small town, less than a thousand people yep. in Kansas. Your first flight was actually to, to San Diego. Camp in San Diego, MCRD, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego. And you, you stand on the yellow footprint, same thing at Camp Lejeune, where you yeah. went to uh, boot camp. Oh, yeah. And get those yellow footprints. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I was going to say, you know, the first time you got on a plane, it wasn't necessarily to go on vacation. No, 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 no. Anything but. <laughs> As a matter of fact. No, the first thing uh, you did, uh, I don't know if I can, uh, I, I probably shouldn't uh, start cussing on your, on your podcast, but. Uh, do whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I went to, uh, we went to San Diego and I think there were maybe, I don't know, 20, 25 kids that, that had, you know, taken the oath in, in Kansas City and uh, from all over that area, Missouri and Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, that whole area. And uh, so they, uh, for whatever reason, gave me the orders, which was just a plane brown manila envelope and said, give this to the drill instructor at, uh, when you get to the airport. And we flew into the airport and, you know, a whole bunch of pretty much hay, hay seats were all looking around, chewing on straw and looking up at the big buildings. And um, uh, I see this guy in, in uh, you know, the drone instructor's outfit, you know, the tan shirt and the, the uh, blue dress slacks with the yeah, red stripe running down it. Very, came over, it could not have been sweeter. Just came over and saw I had this envelope and he said, so uh, are, are you boys here from the Marine Corps? And uh, I said, yes, sir, I'm supposed to get this to you. <coughs> And he just looks at me and says, get the fuck outside. So that, <laughs> that was my introduction to adult life. Sort of. Adult. Yeah. Wow. That's, uh, yeah, that's pretty. What year did you go in? You said you were 17 years old. What year was this? Yeah, 1964. 1964. Yeah. Now you know how old I am today. Yeah. Well, soon. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we start, we start taping on, uh, well, tentatively. We don't know when we're going to start taping, I guess, in reality, but tentatively, we start taping on my birthday, so that'd be cool. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, 
you're 17 years old. You, you, you're the first time you're on. What, now, what led your, to your decision to join the military? And more importantly, the Marines. I mean, not everybody yeah. makes that decision every day. How did you? Always wanted, uh, always wanted to. Uh, it was one of those things. I, I had so many things I wanted to do in life. There was just so I came in, just really wanted to do things. I wasn't the hardest worker, but I was the hardest dreamer. <laughs> As a young person, I later became the hardest worker, but uh, I started with uh, with all these dreams, and I wanted to do a lot of different things. And uh, I loved history. As I said, I read a lot. A lot of the things I read were history. And of course, uh, I came along as the country was in that bloom after World War II. So the 60s, growing in the late 50s and the early 60s, you know, you, we still have that Pax Americana. And, and, um, and of that, uh, of all those uh, military forces, which were very prominent during the Cold War, you know, absolutely the Marine Corps was by far the best, the best known, known, for, uh, known for what the Marine Corps is. Uh, and, um, uh, that's what I wanted to do. I thought about going to the Naval Academy. Uh, there was something that told me you probably are going to fuck out, so don't go. Uh, thought about uh, going to some uh, uh, colleges that had uh, actually pursued me to, to play football. Uh, I, I was not too bad in that, and I had some some opportunities to do that. But I thought, you know what? Let's maybe I should do all that later, maybe what I need to do is get out in the world, see what it's like, travel, and uh, the best way to do that, since I'd only graduated high school, is to, to join the Marine Corps, because I, I, I didn't know anything else. I wasn't really qualified. I wanted to be a writer, and the Marine Corps recruiter lied to me, basically, and said, oh, you can be a writer in the Marine Corps. You can, no worry, come on, you can, you, you'll be a writer. Turns out he was right, but it was purely by accident. When I went to, uh, Boot camp, I don't know if it was the same way with you, because boot camp has changed over the years to some degree. And um, they gave us an aptitude test uh, in the first three or four days we were there. And I turned up, I got the high score on that aptitude test. And they just happened to be looking for people to become writers, journalists. 4312 was the MOS, and that's information services. And um, I actually did, despite the fact that the recruiter flat out lied to me, I actually did become. Uh, a, a journalist in the Marine Corps, and and then uh, uh, later a combat correspondent in uh, Vietnam. Wow, wow. So, yeah, that's that's a very unique perspective. Yeah, it's one of those things that I've always been blessed with a, a good streak of of uh, good fortune, and uh, things seem to always work out. Now, the road sometimes is, is very rough and bumpy, but things seem to always work out. And that's one of the, that's one of the, early, the early things, the fact that I wanted to write and was actually put in a place where I could learn to write and become a writer. And, uh, and I wanted to be a Marine. I was put in a place where I, I could do it. I had to lie. I was born with asthma. So I had to tell them I didn't have asthma. And uh, the only time in my life, as a matter of fact, that I never had an asthma attack was when I was in the Marine Corps. Yeah. I know. Go figure. Go figure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess there's too many other things to, you know. I don't know. I, I have no, to this day, you know, I was in good shape, but I've been in good shape in other parts. So, you know, I always loved sports. I always played sports, uh, even yeah. with really, really severe asthma. That almost died several times. Really? And uh, so the asthma was quite, quite severe, but, um, I, you know, it, it, it's a good question. Who, who knows? When my, uh, I don't, I, I can tell you my head wasn't in a great space all, all the time. <laughs> so that I could tell you for sure. Yeah. So I don't know what, uh, what led to that. Okay. So thank you for that. So let's recap that. I mean, essentially, you're always an avid reader. You wanted to be a writer. You also wanted to be a serving in the military. You wanted to be a Marine, as you said small town, went to San Diego. Yes. And then it was kind of off to the races. You actually, and you, and you actually became a journalist and a combat correspondent in Vietnam. Can, can we get into that? I did. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you watch Full Metal Jacket, 
you yes. see what I did. Uh, Matthew Modine's character is basically what I did. Uh, okay. And so that, so I can, I, that's how I describe my, my job. You, you did a lot of things, obviously, uh, uh, a little bit differently than him, but uh, we do everything from go out and cover a story, uh, no matter what it would be, assault or sometimes even, even an ambush. I would sometimes even uh, uh, be a bodyguard for civilian correspondents, which I enjoyed a lot because they were always very interesting and they had led very interesting lives uh, and uh, really enjoyed being with the British correspondents. I don't know what it was. They, they had, had this kind of interesting attitude that others didn't bring with them. And um, uh, so, you know, here I am at 17, 18 years old and uh, in, in a, a world that is drastically different than my world before and what most people experience, but a lot of opportunity in that world too. And I was fortunate enough to take advantage of that and get to know a lot of people. Uh, and, um, you know, one of these days I'll put that down on paper someday. Wow. So do you have actual documentation of your work as a yeah. correspondent during those years? Absolutely. Yeah. I've got my, uh, got my little book uh, uh, that I used to take around. And uh, when I needed it, I'm, I'm probably, I'm maybe one of the few actors who actually, his writing was his fallback job. It's usually, <laughs> usually it doesn't work that way. You know, usually I'd go out and get a job as a waiter, but writing was always my fallback job. And I was able to uh, go out and walk into a newspaper and bring my book with me and say, hey, this is what I can do. And, you know, let me do it for you. Hmm. Wow. So, and then how, so, how many years did you serve on active duty? I was there almost three years, uh, a little bit, a little bit less, because in the end I got hurt in uh, in the war, and I was a medevac to um, uh, Great Lakes Naval Station. In those days, they tried to get you as close as you could to um, to your home. And I grew up in Kansas. Great Lakes is uh, outside of Chicago, near Waukegan, and. Uh, so uh, I was actually I was actually medevac there. It was very interesting sort of uh, things that came together. I, I was injured in the war, but but not very seriously. But just enough, as strange as it seems, for those medical records to ca catch up to me. And after all that time, and I was really within months of being discharged anyway. But uh, the, the medical records caught up and they said, oh, wait a minute, you have asthma. You're not supposed to be here. He said, well, too late now. <laughs> you guys have already used all the stuff up. Uh, and um, so everything kind of came together once again, good fortune. At the end, came back. I spent the last uh, three months in the hospital at Great Lakes, but that was hardly, uh, hardly a difficult chore. And uh, so it was, uh, uh, that experience was, was creative in that it formed some of my early opinions and some of the ways I, I look at the world. That sounds pretty interesting to say the least. I mean, just to feed that back to you, uh, you, you served three years starting in 1964. You covered the war in Vietnam as a combat correspondent. You were injured. Did you receive a Purple Heart too? No, just injured. Just injured. They just put me out and said, "Okay." A lot of people didn't get Purple Hearts. Believe me. There were so many, so many kind of ticky tack injuries, and some people, some people ran to them and got, um, you know, got Purple Hearts, got discharged, got returned to the states. Other people uh, were very horrifically injured, and I. Yeah. I saw, I never, I never delve into it very much because um, even on the plane when I was coming back, you know, I'm sitting there on the plane. I never forget a, a young uh, lieutenant who was a little, probably a little bit older than I was, obviously, but uh, from Kansas, and he was sharing the seat with me. But you know, right next to us are guys who are missing faces and arms and hands. It just, it just, it's never seemed to me to be something that I wanted to uh, dwell on too long. Wow. 
Sounds pretty intense. Uh, well, I'm glad you made it back, and I'm glad we're able to be able to tell your story today. Yeah. Uh, and you said that, so the last three months, essentially, yeah. were Those spent guys were the real, those were the guys. Yeah, well, the last three months were sent in the hospital, but the same thing, uh, now that I'm reminded we're talking about it, that plane trip, which was, uh, which was pretty fascinating, and, I, and, he, and this, this guy and I had a long, had a lot of, in that long flight, we flew to the Philippines, and we flew to Japan, then finally to Oakland to come home, and then eventually to Great Lakes. We had a lot of uh, conversations both about the war and what it meant, and these guys that are, that are laying there right next to us, and the, and the, uh, the sounds were, were, were just horrific, and he'd been shot in the thigh, pretty clean, clean wound, and went right through, and we both kind of, I think together said, you know what, these guys need to be recognized, not us. We're, we're getting through this pretty easily. Yeah, you, you know, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty graphic. And you, you know, early, earlier in the interview, you said you'd kind of describe yourself as a, um, what was it, a, a streak of good fortune. Yes, yes, uh, that's, that's how I would describe my life. I think there's, there's a lot of that, uh, you know, at, at a time there. Uh, it seems that uh, if I look back, there's always something, there's always something there that comes up and it doesn't allow me to despair for very long. And I can be optimistic because optimism has, has paid off in the past. Okay. And, uh, uh, and I'm very grateful for that. Very good. Now, just to kind of, now what made you want to become a journalist? I mean, are you the type of person that just kind of, would you consider yourself an observer? Oh, without question. No, absolutely. Without question. Um, it, and it wasn't so much that I, I, you know, it had more to do with, uh, uh, eventually becoming a novelist. And, uh, you know, my, my first goal was to write a political column for the Washington Post. And number two would be a novelist. Uh, the political column is undoubtedly out, but the novelist might still be uh, attainable, I think is very much attainable. Um, so that, that, that's what it lasts on, because I love books so much. And I love writers so much and authors. And I still, I still consider authors to be some of the most special people in the world. The fact that this world comes out of their heads and they set it down on a, one of the most intimidating things in the world, which is a blank piece of paper. And um, so that really is what spurred me on to wanting to become a writer. And, um, and then later on, uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps and went to, uh, went to college and was invited to an audition from a play, um, I guess my love for writing was more fickle than I thought because it was replaced pretty quickly by a love for, for the theater and, and creating in that way. Gotcha, gotcha. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you for sharing that. So if you could take us, so the last three months of your, of your uh, active career was in the hospital, what happened after that? Well, uh, when I went home and um, went back home and decided, well, you know, I'll, I'll take the next step along this journey and I'll go to college and major in uh, pre-law. That was uh, part of the plan because my thinking was uh, with the law degree, and I still believe that, that I think a law degree is one of the best, most portable occupations to have because you can pretty much go anywhere you want, at least within the country and take the bar and practice law. And I, I always thought that. And I also thought it would be a good prerequisite for becoming a political writer and, and uh, hopefully a, a columnist of some renown, stacking up my Pulitzers along the wall. And uh, so I thought, uh, I thought a law degree would, would work for that. Uh, I met um, uh, one of my closest friends to this day uh, in the first two or three days and we would meet in the cafeteria and, share conversation over coffee. And uh, as our conversations often went, is where do you meet, where do you meet women here on campus? You know, it was in Topeka, Kansas, was the capital of Kansas, but not a rip roaring socializing spot. It doesn't, uh, it, 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 you wouldn't choose between Topeka and Ibiza 
for instance, if you're going to go out for a party. So, <laughs> um, so we, you know, where, where do you meet women? Where do you meet women? He was a theater major, and uh, he said, "Come on over. We're auditioning tonight. Just going over and audition." I thought I had done high school plays, like so many other people, but you know, 27 people in my high school class. So it wasn't like I was coming up and driving against great competition. Uh, uh, but I did go over. I read for the play. I got cast in the play. And uh, as I said, little did I know that I would be, uh, I would be finding a whole new love mm. across the crowded room that night. Ah, I see. So that's where it started. That's where it started. That's where it started. It was just, it was just something special about it. Um, you know, I'm always, I'm always fascinated about journeys and the routes that people take to get to where they are. And uh, when you read a lot of history, you read biographies and, and yeah, there is so much that is left to chance to be truthful. You know, a lot of people can plan out every moment, but very few of us are that, are that organized in our lives and are that focused and clear cut about what we're going to do. And uh, most of us have to be more nimble and kind of sort of follow our dreams and you get a little opening, you see a little light there uh, I was a running back and when I played football and I learned that vision has a lot to do with, with being a running back. And so you see those lanes open up so you can make that move and make that cut. And I think the same thing goes on with life. Very good. Very good. Thank you for that. So you got this role. Yeah. You got cast in a, in a play. And uh, it's, it's, do you, so that's essentially the sounds like the turning point into acting. Where well, it was. It was. The play was called The, the Mad Woman of Chio, and a uh, classic kind of French farce uh, piece. And um, uh, I was a, a police sergeant. Uh, some, some humor in, in that role, some little seriousness, but some humor, but in learning how to do it. So I actually changed some of my classes almost the next morning because it was early in school so you could change classes and added in a couple of uh, theater courses that I, I didn't have before and withdrew from a couple of others. Um, and I learned right away that there's something about this that kind of combined a lot of things that I could do, a lot of things I wanted to do, a lot of things I hoped I could do. and um, uh, I really wanted to get involved in this. So literally, we did the play. There was a, a, a gentleman from the community who had, who ran one of the local theaters there. And he asked me to do my second show. It was going to be my second show. And it was called Here's Love, which is the uh, musical comedy version of one of my favorite movies called Miracle on 34th Street. And uh, you know, I don't know if you know that one about the Macy's Santa Claus. And it's a movie that I have watched uh, every Christmas in my adult life. I just, I, it's a wonderful movie. It's a very timely sort of mid 20th century film. And uh, so I got to play the, uh, the lawyer of the judge, which is sort of, sort of a semi opportunistic guy. He's not a bad guy, he's just opportunistic. And, uh, I got to sing and dance on stage, something that if you had asked me two months before, I would say, ha, 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 I ain't doing that. And uh, here I am singing and dancing on stage. And it was so much fun. And doing a musical was so much fun. And um, uh, so much so that actually the next, the very next production I did was one that I did. Uh, I decided, well, you know, there's a way to make some money here. So I put together a collection of one act plays that had some small uh, relevant message to it and um, put that together to travel around to schools and went to the school board and sold it as a traveling show and put together a little company of, uh, uh, I don't remember the exact number, eight or nine people and cast them in it. And I started to rehearse them. I directed, directed that piece. So by the third time around, I was actually producing and directing 
my own material. Wow. So that's pretty, um, so you developed the skill set pretty much that was kind of all encompassing sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it turned out to be, well, you know, when you grow up, I, I had mentioned that um, there are different values you learn in a small town and uh, that, that I feel helps you as you go through life. But uh, one of those is knowing that the only real road uh, to success is working hard. And um, ultimately, good luck comes from good work. And the harder you work, the better your luck becomes. And um, so that's the only way I knew how to do it. And believe me, in Topeka, Kansas, there weren't a lot of ways of making money. There were some, and I actually got to take advantage of, of those uh, that were there and uh, felt very fortunate about that. Also, it created, it created an early support system. Uh, it, uh, you know, I was uh, a guy who just came into a city to go to college and how many, how many other veterans got off the bus that day to do the same thing. But it, it began to make me uh, somewhat known in the community. And I learned that lesson early on too, that if uh, I became known in the community, got to know the uh, people around City Hall, in this case, the State House uh, as well, then uh, that would open more, more opportunities. Very good. And when did you move back out to the West Coast? Well, uh, that's interesting. Nobody's ever put it that way, but I guess that's true since I was living out here in boot camp and infantry training. Um, it, was, it was later. I, I had a really rocky, not that I noticed, I, I was having fun, but uh, my beginning to civilian life was a little unsettled. I think a little bit of it had to do with the war and a little bit had to do with other things. So basically every time somebody came by and said, you want to do this, I would go, yeah, let's do that. So uh, a friend of mine came by one day and said, oh, I've got a job on, a, on an oil tanker out of Brownsville, Texas. You want to go? And I said, sure. So I called up the head of the department and said, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to drop out because I'm going to go work on this oil tanker. And then somebody else would say, oh, there's a, a chance to do this. I go, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And uh, so I, and there was a little bit of being peripatetic and traveling around and uh, all of that, but with enough stability that um, I would always come back to school. I'd always get involved in theater. Uh, I began to learn about Shakespeare. I began to learn about the Greeks. I began to get a foundation in, um, in what theater was and what the craft of acting was and the craft of directing as well. Uh, and that was very important to me. Uh, it, and I didn't know it at the time. I was just having a good time. But I realized I was setting those building blocks for a, a good, solid career. Very good, very good. So essentially, you were just kind of, as you said, those were kind of some unsettling times after the military, kind of transitioning back into society, yeah. trying to kind of find your place. Uh, it sounds like uh, you were kind of going with the wind at, at certain points, you know, just kind of... Um, but it was a valuable thing. It was a very valuable thing. And I was still essentially a teenager. I mean, 20 years old. Yeah. So, and, and it was a good, it was a valuable, it was a very valuable thing to do. You know, I, I know my mother and other people, the head of the theater department, other people that were grown, the grownups, the uh, people with some age on them all, all looked at it with a great deal of suspicion. Like, you know, this guy needs to settle down. He's been in the service, all this. I don't know why people expect that to be, uh, be a, sometimes it's a maturing thing for people and sometimes it isn't. In my case, it, it wasn't tremendously maturing, but it also didn't take away from understanding what the moment was given to, uh, giving to me. And um, uh, so being able to do that was creating uh, what would be the, the character of, of James Reynolds that I would play for the rest of my life mm. and other, other uh, characters would come in and out of that. But you know, whatever I was, was going to come out of all 
these things that were going on at the moment. Ah, I see. Did you have that clarity and perspective? Did that clarity and perspective come later? Like, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you don't have. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I was much too young and much too uh, too flighty to have that clarity at that time. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, understandable. I mean, yeah, that's a pretty pretty incredible story so far. So, what was the opportunity that got you out back out to L.A.? Well, uh, that was a little bit of a pathway too. Um, I, uh, uh, continuing this sort of back and forth behavior, coming out, doing a play, uh, working sometimes for, uh, uh, for money and other ongoing theater companies and doing that. Uh, eventually a friend of mine, um, told me about a theater company in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And, um, uh, and he said, yeah, they're auditioning and, you know, maybe you want to come, uh, it might be something you, you'd be interested in doing over the summer. And, uh, and I was starting to realize that I uh, probably should leave college uh, just to involve myself in, in becoming an actor and getting involved in the theater uh, and uh, realizing that um, there was so much out there that I needed to involve myself in this world. And so I went out there and I did audition for that theater company and I was cast. And, uh, um, which was great. And once again, singing and dancing on stage, which was something, uh, you know, which I loved doing. I loved doing, but it was still relatively new. And we were doing lots of skits and different uh, oleos sort of out of a 19th century kind of early vaudeville uh, thing. And it was, it was uh, fun to do and great to do, but the company, the theater company was having problems and the fellow who started the company wanted out and he was losing a lot of money, he wanted out. And so he basically asked if I would be willing to take over the company and kind of gently lower it into its grave. And, you know, at the end of the summer, everything would be shut down and walk away. And so I said, sure, I'll do that. And uh, even though I uh, wasn't quite sure how to do it, but I thought, absolutely. And uh, which I, um, which I did with the cooperation of all the people who were involved in that company, some of whom are still great friends today. And um, thought to myself that, and, but during that time, there, was, there were two things that were happening. One is Colorado was, was becoming a center for film production and television. And um, uh, I ended up getting an agent somehow because of that, this agent uh, who was a, a well-known actor from the 40s and 50s called Richard Erdman. And Richard was a well-known actor, a character actor. And so he signed me and I did a national commercial that actually mentioned my name uh, for Primatine Mist. Once again, asthma comes back to help me out. And uh, it was an asthma medication. It was just me, James Reynolds, playing basketball and basically said, James Reynolds plays basketball and when he gets an asthma attack, he goes for primatine mist. And, uh, and I did. I actually used the product. Uh, so that was a big advantage. And then they decided to do a, a movie uh, with Charles Bronson called Mr. Majestic. And it was about, it was based on an Elmore Leonard novel one of my favorite writers. And uh, it was being shot in Southern Colorado because he was a melon farmer who got involved with the mob. And there was one unpicked melon field in America, which happened to be in La Junta, Colorado. So once again, that good fortune comes up and I'm the guy. And I became good friends with a lot of the actors on the film. Uh, and uh, several of the actors said, look, you gotta come to LA. You know, we, uh, we have some people we can introduce you to, certainly get you an agent. And uh, so I said, okay, I think it's time. So once that summer was up, uh, a good friend of mine, a man named Von Armstrong was uh, my roommate then. He was from Redlands and he thought it was time for him to go home too. And so we, we, we drove west. I have an old fashioned console radio and I drove an old, Opal Renault, a car which is about as big as I am. That's about it. 
So I strapped that radio on the top and followed uh, Vaughn and his Dodge Darger to Redlands. And uh, the people I had met were true to their word. I ended up started interviewing with agents. I chose an agent um, and um, actually got a screen test pretty much right away when I first got out here. Um, and that didn't pan out, but um, people started to see me and I started to work mm. uh, quite a lot, actually. Wow. Wow, that's yeah, uh, pretty, uh, pretty quick, pretty heady stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, if, and eventually that led to your, <coughs> your success in um, daytime. Eventually, down the road, it was a little, little bit, a few things happened in between. And uh, okay. Okay. yeah, I was lucky enough to do um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of TV in, in several movies, uh, cast pretty often. I, I didn't have a lot of downtime, not a lot of out of work time. I should okay. say, I had some downtime, but not a lot of out of work time. And uh, I got my first, um, my first series, which was a, a syndicated series called Keeper of the Wild, and uh, where I played a, a doctor in Africa who was born in America next to uh, a doctor from America who was born in Africa. So I was the black doctor who was born in the U.S. He was a white doctor who had been born in Africa. It was fun. It was fun. It was fun. We had a lot of, a lot of wild animals on the set, and I had to work with these animals, which was a little nerve-wracking at times because uh, they were wild animals. I mean, and uh, so a little scary. I mean, we had to lock down whenever they do things like the tiger is on the set. You know, you had to go in your dressing room, lock it down. And because uh, uh, who knew? Who knew what the tiger was going to do? But that was that was great fun. And then I was uh, lucky enough to do uh, another series, a nighttime series called uh, uh, Time Express with Vincent Price the only television series he ever did. He uh, never did one before, never did one after. And once again, good fortune for me in that I was the young guy. It was about a train that would take you back to live uh, a moment in your past. And uh, so that, so your life could get off this treadmill it was on. And I was the young guy on the show of the regular cast people. They had the engineer and the conductor and Vincent Price was God. He was the head of the line, and his wife, uh, uh, Flora Brown, Cora Brown, was uh, the uh, was Mrs. God, mm. and uh, so uh, I would interact between God and the people going back in time. Loved every moment of it. Got to meet some of the uh, some of the hotter actors of the moment. Uh, in fact, uh, Jerry Stiller, who just passed away, was uh, one of the guest stars on that store on that on that show. So it was great. It turns out that Days was the, the third series uh, during this, and they didn't want to see me. Uh, during this time, uh, I'd been shooting the other show, uh, and then it, it was eventually canceled. But they had seen so many actors. Uh, and uh, even though they knew who I was, they thought, well, this isn't, gonna, this isn't going to work. And as I find out, they actually had another actor cast. But uh, my agent uh, was persuasive enough to talk them into seeing me, and I did, and it evidently changed minds, and they changed the character, made him a little younger. He was uh, supposed to be married. They made him single, and uh, so uh, suddenly I find myself from a 19th century conductor to a 20th century uh, police officer, uh, somewhat single, looking around, and uh, that was the uh, third series. During this time, I was doing film, television, theater. I'd even started a theater. And uh, so that, that was a very, very busy time in my life and a very creative time. Wow. So I got to ask you, what's, well, just to recap, uh, you said the, eight, you know, the agent kind of talked talk them into it. Uh, do you, you attribute your success in in the film industry and then in the TV industry? Do you attribute that 
How much do you attribute that to your agents and your representation that you had during those days? Well, a lot. You know, a good representation is is really is really key. I mean, you know, they they open the door, but you definitely have to be the one that keeps the door open. Okay. Uh, if you can't do that, then you know you could have you could have the best agent in the world, and all you're in for is a lot of disappointment, both from you and the agent. And uh, but a, a lot. I mean. Uh, my agent got me in that door. It was closed. It was shut tight and it was locked down. And <clears throat> so that was one of those moments because you only get told the most successful actor in the world only gets told yes a very small number of times. Most of what you're going to hear is no, which has nothing necessarily to do with your level of talent or anything else to do with you, it has to do with what the observer sees at that moment. Sometimes they can see beyond, they see something that you want them to see, and sometimes it doesn't work that way. But I, I feel so fortunate that um, even, though I, I, even though I knew that door was closed, I was able to go in and um, change minds. Very good, very good. And so, I mean, you are actually an Emmy Award winner, is that correct? I am. Yeah. I am. Very, yeah, absolutely. It's back here somewhere, I think. That's why I thought, that's, that's why I thought I was thinking right now. Yeah, I saw it uh, in the back. I was wondering if that was, if that was it. It is back there. It is right there. And uh, it's usually in the other room, but I uh, um, had, I don't know why I had it back here, actually. Probably cleaning. And uh, I just got a call. It says spam risk, so I won't be, I won't be uh, answering that call. Um, yeah, so I, yes, uh, one of the great moments of my life. Uh, you know, one of the things we all get, and we, uh, I've been lucky enough to have been nominated a number of times, which is in and of itself pretty exciting stuff. And, um, uh, you know, I, I love that moment, but, you know, you, want, you do want to win, after all. And, uh, and it's what you dream about your whole life. I mean, I defy people to say, and somebody will say it, but I, I, I question if they're telling the truth. But uh, I defy actors, directors, writers to say they haven't rehearsed the Oscar speech, or they haven't rehearsed the Tony speech, or they haven't rehearsed the Emmy speech. And it's something that we all grow up and want to do and want to have that chance and want to have that opportunity. And it changes over time. You know, I'm not shy about saying, oh, yeah, I've walked my dog a hundred times and rehearsed my accepted speech. Or I remember back years ago being backpacking up in the Rockies and uh, out of breath walking up a, a mountainside and rehearsing my acceptance speech. And uh, to think, here I am, here I am accepting this Emmy, uh, you know, from Oscaloosa, Kansas and 800 people when, when uh, I was very excited. Yeah. Um, now, I mean, how did you get to that point? I mean, how many years were you in daytime? I mean, can we, can oh, we kind of go through your daytime experience yeah. biologically? Absolutely. Well, essentially I took 50 years to get to that point. Basically, <laughs> basically since I walked out on that, stage and audition for the sergeant and uh, the bad woman of Shia. So it took me a, a long, long time. And, um, you know, daytime uh, from that moment when I went into that little room. And you have to remember these people, uh, when I auditioned for days, they had already seen certainly more than 100 people. I don't know. Uh, but somewhere between 100 and 200 people because this character had been on the books for a while, and uh, he was part of a tandem of characters. Abe's partner, my, my character, Abe Carver, was supposed to come on about six weeks after my character came on. So this is a big turning point in, in days of our lives history, and that actually ultimately became a big turning point in uh, soap opera and television history. Uh, and uh, uh, so on that October day, and it happened to be October 31st, which I forget every year until I get a text or something from uh, fans saying, oh, it's your anniversary. Um, 
And uh, so being able to be able to walk in that room packed with people. And uh, I, I don't know if you've ever read for the network or gotten network approval or done any of that, but you go in these rooms that are just packed with people. They're small offices usually. And uh, you're reading, doing what you think you can do to get this role. And I've been through that uh, a number of times. Sometimes I've gotten it, sometimes I haven't. But, uh, you know, that was interesting because I knew I didn't have the role. I knew when I walked in, I didn't have the role. And maybe that was the freedom I needed to walk in there and uh, give the performance I gave, which apparently was effective enough to give me the role. Wow. So essentially, you, you pretty much nailed the opportunity. Uh, I, I guess you'd have to say that uh, yeah. almost 40 years later. Yeah. <laughs> now, how would you compare theater to on camera? Closer than you think. Um, you know, I, I think everybody gets those questions. You know, what do you prefer, film, TV, movies? and all that. I like it all. I mean, if I'm working, I'm happy. And I, I like it all. But everything has a different, uh, everything has something different to it. And you approach it in a different way. You do it in a different way. Uh, what I find on, um, what I find on, on daytime is the preparation is remarkably similar. Now, obviously, we have to learn lines faster. Uh, but in the old days of daytime, not now, when we have to work so fast, and go in and shoot so many shows so quickly. But in the old days, it was one show a day. And I do know that sounds absurd to people out there thinking that we had more time, but we did. It was, uh, as it turns out, we didn't know it then, but the pace was more leisurely. We had uh, more of an opportunity to do, create. And um, it was much more like theater because we had three rehearsals a day, full, complete rehearsals, and then go off and do it. Uh, and I really enjoyed that uh, a lot. Um, but, you know, not dissimilar. The old days where uh, theater actors were often discounted uh, because they said, oh, you, you know, the camera's right here. You've got to be able to bring it to the camera, which is right in on your face. Um, and theater actors can't do that because they, they have to be broad. Everything, the gestures are like this. Um, it's not true. Everything overlaps now. Mm. Everything overlaps now. And uh, uh, television actors are all over theater. Movie actors are all over the stage. Uh, people go back and forth. Uh, you know, daytime actors, uh, nighttime actors come back to daytime and do daytime again. Uh, daytime actors easily step in and do a movie. The, I remember one of the first movies I did after... Uh, after I had started doing days, and I'd never done a show before I did days, but one from one of the first movies, uh, Alan Rudolph, Alan Randolph, uh, who was directing that, uh, came up to me and said, you know, I really love that you know where the camera is. You know where that camera is. And, uh, you know, I was very appreciative of that because I was still relatively new in daytime, but we were shooting with four cameras. Mm -hmm. So I had to know where I stood on that stage in, in relation to those four cameras. So it all overlaps. It's all one. If you become a good actor in one medium, you are going to be a good actor in the other. Wow. You, get, you got me convinced. You still here? <laughs> good. Okay. <laughs> Your uh, <coughs> your audio is kind of getting a little muffled. Are you are you still with us? Can you still see me? Oh, I think it, well, I'll speak up a little louder if that maybe that will help. No, I lost, and, uh, I'm still I, having the internet yeah, issue. Yeah, it's, the, it's not you. It's, little, uh, yeah, it's not you. It's not you. It's the connection. I don't. I don't have your. It's okay. We work well, around it. It's breaking up. Yeah. No, that sounds fine. It's breaking. Up. Okay, you're good now. Yeah. Go go ahead then. Okay, yeah. so, so also in your in your bio, uh, I'm seeing you starred in a uh, 
a drama titled Tracers. Yes. Yes, Tracers, uh, Tracers is, uh, was a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, play about, um, about Vietnam, Vietnam veterans. Uh, John DeFusco, John DeFusco, who uh, is a very well-known uh, writer and director in local theater scenes, and certainly uh, back in the days, we all kind of started at the same time. We all kind of got in uh, town uh, in the 70s, the middle 70s, and uh, John was one of the people that I met during this time. And he created uh, Tracers uh, by interviewing a lot of veterans. He's known a lot of veterans. He was in the Air Force and got to know a lot of veterans. So basically, he compiled this play from the real life experience of all of these veterans. And if you're a veteran of Vietnam, you, you understand it. I'm sure there's somebody doing exactly the same thing with Iraq and Afghanistan. I hope they are. It's a great historical record because they, it is based on experiences that people had and the language is, uh, is very recognizable to Vietnam veterans. And you know, every war has its own particular language. They adopt some from the previous war and bring that, drag that along with them, but they also create their own, their own. And I remember once when I was in Afghanistan, I've been to Afghanistan a couple of times, and uh, one, of the, uh, one of the Marines I was talking to there was asking me, what's the difference between Afghanistan and Vietnam? And I said, email, because everything else is the same. The web gear smells the same, um, you know, uh, the terminology, much, much of it is very similar. Uh, and, and, but the fact that you could, conceivably be in the middle of a firefight and be on your cell phone, which I would not want to be, by the way, uh, is, uh, is bizarre to me. And the fact that you can go back to your hooch at night and log on and email with your friends and family, it's incredible. It's incredible to me. So, but war is war and war doesn't change very much over the years. You said you've been in Afghanistan several times. Yeah. How did you... And also uh, that whole Middle Eastern area, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Kuwait, um, a lot of the areas around the, around the Middle East. How did you get those opportunities? Well, a couple, couple ways. I, I uh, worked with the USO for, for years, actually. Uh, and um, uh, shortly after 9-11, I started working with the USO. I went to, uh, that Christmas actually, I went to Kuwait. And, um, and then after that, I began making two or three trips a year. And sometimes uh, my, my, my son would go with me. Our unwritten rule was that if it was a war zone, my son would go with me. And if it was Europe, my wife would go with me. Ah. So they both got trips to uh, war zones and to Europe. My son got trips to Europe too, because we always had to have a connecting flight somewhere. So we would connect in Rome or Amsterdam or Paris. And that was, that was a nice benefit. But it was great being with all the kids as well. I just, I loved, I loved those trips. I loved interacting with all of those young men and women. It was just astounding. I hope to do it again soon. And uh, uh, I also ended up working for Armed Forces Entertainment, which is the Armed Forces doing their own branch of that. Uh, the USO, as you know, is not a government agency at all. It's a private independent agency, depends on donations. And um, so they were both fantastic and wonderful. They were just called handshake tours. I go, I visit with a bunch of people, sign autographs, talk about their home life, their love life, if they wanted to talk about the situation as it was, whether it was uh, the war in Iraq or whether it was uh, Lakers basketball. I'd be there to talk to him. Wow, sounds pretty remarkable, James. It was. It was. It, it was. Uh, it wasn't remarkable on my part. What was remarkable that these guys are doing their jobs over and over again, thousands of miles away from home. Oh, Very guys and girls. Yes, I say guys in the in the uh, in the sense of guys and girls. And um, uh, the uh, that, that's what's remarkable to me. And they're so young. And they reminded me 
very much uh, many of them of myself when I was that that age and uh, to see uh, to see how well they do their job always oh, sort of it's interesting and this has been forever ever since the first word of history was written but you see these young people who are disparaged basically in society as a whole young people get the bad the bad knock no matter when it is no matter what's going on but the military always puts their trust in them and gives them responsibilities and these kids always come through that's right that's right wow so i mean and you're still looking forward to putting more time in to to, to travel and oh yeah without question without question no no i want i want would love to go back out there are places i wanted to see i was talking to uso about some places that I wanted to visit that have gotten a lot of people. I did end up going to a lot of places that a lot of people say no to. And uh, so that was, uh, I, I was very happy and proud. I, and I actually uh, came up with their first educational program uh, for uh, their dependents, for the children of veterans. And uh, one of the things I constantly wanted to remind people is that the men and women who are the, the spouses and the parents and the sons and daughters, they're, they're serving too. They're serving as well. They're serving at the same time. Many of them are on bases. I went to the base when it existed in Iceland, in Italy, Spain. Uh, I started this educational problem uh, program at a base in um, uh, Georgia, here in this country, in the state of Georgia. Um, and these families, they are as much in the military as their serving husbands and wives and sons and daughters. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. I mean, you know, that, that, that says a lot, that says a lot, you know, that, about your, um, <clears throat> dedication to that and not, not forgetting where you, where you came from and what you've been through. Yeah, you know, it's hard, you know, I, I was not, um, uh, certainly I came back from Vietnam with uh, a different kind of attitude I, and, you know, wasn't a great supporter of Vietnam and, uh, uh, and so that's, and, and still, still believe that to this day, but I understand those kids. I understand what we do. I understand patriotism. I understand wanting to wear the uniform of your country. My, one of my um, the most proud days I ever had. I don't know if you felt this way, but it was graduation day in boot camp, out on the grinder with the band playing and you actually marching. And, and you know, uh, that was an extraordinarily proud moment for me. And uh, I believe very, 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 very strongly in, in duty to country and service. And, um, uh, and that includes that includes uh, criticizing the country if necessary. But um, but when you serve, you 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 are building a platform from which to make that criticism. Uh, and uh, I mean, you are you are a former Marine, as am I. And you don't have to serve in the Marine Corps, and you don't necessarily have to serve in the military to have that have that feeling. But understand that we we uh, have a very unique form of government. And but it takes us working at it constantly to make it to make it uh, beneficial to us all. Thank you for that, James. Anything else on on anything that we've covered before we kind of go? I kind of want to get into Promised Land a little bit. See what you're absolutely, absolutely. Well, I will mention that we have the. Uh, I think I mentioned in my bio that we have the uh, Fremont Center Theater in. Uh, South Pasadena, uh, which we've had now for over 20 years. And uh, we're very proud of that theater. We've had, uh, it's, been, it's an award-winning theater. We've, uh, uh, all of our, all, literally all of our plays have been very well received with great, great audience support. And uh, that's, been, that's been a godsend. And that enables both my wife and myself to, uh, we don't, we don't work as actors as often in the theater as we do as a director and producer. I've uh, directed most of the uh, shows that our, our theater company has done. 
And my wife has produced all of the shows that our theater company has, has performed. And so it's very much a mom and pop. We're mom and pop. <laughs> it's very much a, a mom and pop company, but we're very, very proud of the uh, Fremont Center Theater. Wow, very good. How can people find more on, on the Fremont Center Theater if they want to uh, check that out? Go to FremontCenterTheater.com, which okay. is always a good place. That leads you to the Fremont Center Theater. Um, my wife formed uh, the uh, South Pasadena Arts Council 10 years ago. Now that has become quite a force in the artistic scene here in South Pasadena. And you can also go to FremontCenterTheater.com and you can follow a link there and go to what we call SPARC, S-P-A-A-R-C. Uh, this is South Pasadena Arts Council. And, um, you know, stay up on things, see what we're doing, join us. We'll be doing some, uh, uh, some things very, very soon that deal with uh, being locked down in quarantine and, and COVID. And uh, I hope people come and get information and, uh, and stick around and, and later on come out and see a show. Sounds fantastic, James. And I wanted to also touch on uh, your involvement with the VA medical Yeah, school. that's that's another very special involvement of mine. Um, uh, I guess it's been about 10 years, maybe a little bit more. Uh, the VA had asked me to become its spokesperson for hospitalized vets and volunteers. The VA has well over 100,000 volunteers around the country. Of course, they, they deal with 25 million veterans around the country also. And uh, so I, I uh, quickly said yes, I would love to do it, and started to visit veterans hospitals uh, around the nation and, and talk to veterans and see what their concerns are. And I was fortunate enough to be asked to do it two more times. So I'm the only one who served three consecutive terms as the spokesperson for the, uh, for the VA and for hospitalized veterans. And that has been such a pleasure. I've gotten to meet uh, World War II veterans, Korean War veterans, Vietnam, and of course, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, the war on terror. And, um, uh, you know, I could, we, could, we could go on for hours and hours and hours. I won't do that to you, but we could. Oh, thank you, James. I mean, it sounds like, yeah, it sounds like an incredible experience. It was. It really was. And it was something else I hope to, uh, I hope to do more of. I know it's a little, a little dicey to do that today, but uh, hopefully we'll be back in a place where you can go in and, and say hello to them. And, they, and they're, they're so happy just to, just to say hi. And uh, the World War II veterans seldom shared their stories. Even their families will say, well, I don't know what dad did. I, I don't know what grandpa did in the war. And, uh, uh, and I think maybe because they're talking to a veteran, I don't tell war stories uh, as a rule. And, uh, but I think the fact that they're talking to somebody uh, who served makes it easier for them to talk about service. Yeah, that makes complete sense. I mean, that's kind of what I've found in my career as well. Um, thank you so much for sharing all that. I mean, it sounds like a pretty remarkable career. Has been, got to tell you. Pretty remarkable life in general. And that brings us to Promised Land. Yes. How did you get involved with that? Good question. Uh, you'll have to ask Jeremy. <laughs> because he's the one that called me. He got in touch with me. Uh, he got in touch with my publicist, uh, Lori DeWall, and uh, who actually was my, she's my former publicist, but we're, uh, we're very good friends. And uh, so she got in touch with him and uh, he gave me his information. And, uh, you know, in talking to Jaron uh, and his uh, uh, reasons behind writing Promised Land, what he's, what he's done, what he'd like to do, it just sounded very good. And then when I did the first reading, which is now only a week ago, I think, when we did that first reading, and I find out uh, that there are so many wonderful, experienced people that are involved in this, I got very excited. I, I told my wife, I said, this is, this is going to be much, much 
better than I thought it was going to be. Because honestly, I just thought, well, I have something to do. During <laughs> Good, I got something to do during the quarantine. Yay. Right, 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 right. Um, yeah. But it's more, it's more than that. This is a very, very uh, professional, legitimate uh, group of people. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it. What are, your, what are your thoughts and expectations on this production? Uh, well, um, <clears throat> I expect it to be good. Number one, <laughs> in my thoughts, I, I'm very, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I, I love the script. I think the script has been written very well, and I know a little bit about the uh, digital soaps, the digital programming that's on now. I think this can enter that realm with some of the the better the better ones in that genre, uh, and uh, and I expect this one. I expect next year to be talking about our, our Emmy nominations. Hell yeah. Me too. If I don't, if I don't get killed off during the uh, first couple episodes, which I better not, Jaron. Well, but you can still get an Emmy if you're killed off. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. 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 That'd be, uh, that'd be great. That'd be fantastic. Well, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to working with you in person. I've interviewed half the cast. It seems like, um, oh, great, great. Great. I've worked with the other half of the cast, so I'm looking forward to it. That's fantastic. Well, Joey, let me, you know, just uh, let me know what, what you want and when to do it. It's, it, you know, it, it, the, obviously the quarantine's a drawback in some ways, but in some ways not. I mean, I, I've been doing, uh, you know, interviews uh, this way. It's easier because I don't have to worry that much about getting dressed and getting myself all together and, uh, so it's, uh, you know, so for doing interviews and that kind of thing, either this or FaceTime, I just looked uh, uh, last night about how to do uh, uh, group meetings on FaceTime, which can be done. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so you let me know and I'll, uh, I'll be there. Well, thank you so much, James. Really appreciate your time. It's been a fantastic interview. Anything else before we wrap this thing up? Uh, no, uh, just let's just uh, stay in touch with each other and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, We'll see what the next the next steps are here. James Reynolds, thank you so much for being with me, sir. Hoorah. <laughs>